The Ryzen 9000 series is upon us seven years after the original Zen Micro architecture launched, with Intel currently getting some bad press after their 13th and 14th gen enthusiast-grade CPUs have reportedly been crashing from being pushed too hard out of the box. AMD has a unique window of opportunity to challenge Intel's market dominance in the x86 space. The question is, is Zen 5 offering anything that makes it worthy of an upgrade? Or is it just another iterative product launch from AMD? Let's find out. This video is sponsored by URCDKeys.com. If you pay full price for a Windows 11 key, you are wasting your money. Instead, you can get a Windows 11 OEM key from URCDKeys.com for just over $29 or even lower at $21.86 if you use my coupon code C25 at checkout. All URCDKeys product keys are on sale right now, so don't miss the Super Spring sale. Follow the link below to the Windows 11 page that you urcdkeys.com. Click purchase, enter your C25 discount code. You can pay with a credit card or PayPal and then just add the Windows key to your Windows activation settings and you're done. The code is sent to you within minutes, by the way. You can also use my C25 code on other products. So if you need Office 2019, make sure to get it from urcdkeys.com for a much lower price than retail. Check the exclusive links in the video description to get your cheap OEM Windows or Office keys to Today from urcdkeys.com. Last week, AMD had their tech day where they disclosed some details on the technical side of the Zen 5 micro architecture. Keeping with tradition, just like we saw IPC jumps in every generation of Zen up until now, Zen 5 also promises a leap in instructions per clock versus Zen 4. I mean, it would be strange if it didn't. One of the key changes in Zen 5 is a new branch predictor and a dual pipe fetch. These were added to mitigate data movement overhead, which has been one of Zen's Achilles heels, with micro stutters happening when the data flow is interrupted. If you have a Zen CPU, you might have experienced such stuttering, especially on non X3D chips. Another feature that stands out is double the bandwidth for the L1 cache and a doubling of the floating point unit, so this should be particularly impactful in gaming workloads. There's also now full 512 bit AVX support instead of the dual 256 bit in Zen 4, so this could potentially be a welcome improvement for things like emulators. The full 512-bit instructions should run on 256 or 128-bit registers, so an emulator like the PS3's RPCS3 can now bump up to 32-vector registers with a full data path. It will be interesting to see what this does to power consumption, if it's anything like on the Intel processors. So compounding all the microarchitecture improvements, AMD estimates up to a 16% IPC up Lift. However, if that's based on these results, you can see Geekbench 5.4 using AES XTS as a massive outlier there in the far right. So this is due to that full 512-bit AVX support, as well as AVX10 and VAES+. If we remove that outlier, the IPC drops to 15%, and that's with this particular selection of in-house tests. Still, a 10% uplift in Far Cry 6 is nothing to scoff at. That could be the difference between running a game in the low 50s up to 60 fps, assuming the bottleneck was the CPU to begin with. Is that really enough of an uplift to warrant an upgrade though? Quasar Zone leaked a multi-threaded result for Cinebench R23 where stock versus stock, the 9950X is only about 9.4% faster than the 7950X. To me that seems very underwhelming, especially considering Zen 5 is using TSMC's 4NX node instead of the N5 node that was used for Zen 4. So from the node alone, you're looking at roughly 15% improvement versus Zen 4, yet at least out of the box the uplift is less than 10%. Now there is this new curve shaper overclocking feature, which is basically a more granular curve optimizer, which I never liked honestly. And now you get bands across temperature and frequency, and you can undervolt in the bands where the CPU is stable, which will give you some efficiency gains, or overvolt in bands where you want to push frequency upwards, but still want to maintain stability. The Quasar result shows a respectable 8% gain versus TOC, which means that over 
overclocked, you can push the 9950X to be roughly 14% faster than the previous gen 7950X, at least in this multi-core workload. The thing is, very few people overclock their systems and with the recent news about Intel's 13th and 14th gen processors degrading from being pushed too hard as default out of the box, I wonder if people will shy away from fiddling with Zen 5's new overclocking features. And just as I was editing this video, another Cinebench result leaked with an additional 700 points at 230 watts, but this was on a custom water cooling loop, mind you. Back to AMD's slides, something interesting is that AMD chose to compare the 14900K to the 9900X instead of the 9950X, which might be an indicator of price, although I'm not sure on that. As far as productivity goes, you can expect 10-16% to uplift as per the node transition estimates, with the handbrake outlier here probably being down to full AVX 512 support. Now as far as gaming is concerned, we see the same level of scaling with the exception of Horizon Zero Dawn had a whopping 22%. There's no indication of resolution or GPU used here, so it's difficult to get a good sense of these results, but given that AMD is claiming leadership in productivity, content creation and gaming, they certainly seem confident that Zen 5 will outpace Intel's best across the board. Perhaps more impressive is the 9700X's performance versus the 14700K, especially considering that the 9700X technically has less threads, and we see the same scaling with the 9600X versus the 14600K. Speaking of the 9700X, according to a report from WCCF Tech, AMD is revising the 8-core R5 to feature a higher TDP and PPT, so at 120 watts from the 65 watts initially announced, which will likely mean higher clock speeds. The purpose of this is making sure the 9700X matches or surpasses the 7800X 3D. Honestly, I'm not sure if I believe this, as was so close to the launch that AMD would have to either recall all the 9700X chips that have already gone to the channel or have motherboard makers have a BIOS update that would override the original specs. If the latter is chosen and a normie user has no idea how to update the BIOS, he will be misled by review numbers, buying the product and then getting way less performance than advertised. This seems like yet another mess in the making for AMD if it turns out to be true. We can see the benefits of TSMC's mature 4 and X node in their TDP changes to all the SKUs except the top 9950X, ignoring this supposed last-minute change to the 9700X. For instance, the 9900X has a TDP of 120 watts compared to 170 watts on the 7900X it's replacing. Same on the R5s, which have a 65-watt TDP now. According to German publication Hardware Lux, there's a 28% increase in transition accounts going from Zen 4 to Zen 5 SKU for SKU, while the die sizes have actually slightly shrunk, so the performance and efficiency improvements we're seeing are likely all down to TSMC's 4 and Next node. A welcome change to these new TDPs is that the 9900X should run fine on a good quality air cooler, which could be a consideration if you need a lot of cores but don't want to invest in a big AIO. As for motherboards, it seems that at launch you will be stuck with the same AM5 models currently on the market, as the 800 series motherboards don't have a launch date yet, although it's been rumored that they will be launching on the 30th of September. That's odd to say the least, but considering AMD's track record when it comes to new motherboard launches, I think this delay might be for the best. In addition to the X870 and 870E high-end motherboards, AMD has announced the B850 and B840 chipsets, which are aimed at the budget segment. B840 should be around the $100 range, but it will be limited to PCIe Gen 3 and won't support CPU overclocking, which is lame. By the way, there was a cool new motherboard announced by Gigabyte recently, the B650. 50E Aorus Stealth, which is the first AMD motherboard to have connectors on the back of the PCB. Not gonna lie, I'm itching to do a build with this board. I assume that the AM5 problems that I encountered when the platform first launched should be ironed out by now, particularly when it comes to maxing out all the PCIe lanes as I need a lot of storage capacity. So that could be a fun project, maybe I'll do a video on it. Anyway, as far as prices are concerned, AMD hasn't finalized prices yet, but there were 
were some leaks from e-commerce listings last month that had the 9950X at $648, the 9900X at $597, the 9700X at $409, and the Ryzen 5 9600X at $315. It's likely that these were just placeholder prices, but it's all we got to go on at the moment. Now, as for the current gen, the prices for the 7000s are $540 for the 7950X, and at the time of recording this, the 7950X 3D is on sale at $477, which seems ridiculously low considering it launched at $700 just over a year ago. The launch of that product was terrible, but I didn't expect it to come down this hard. The 7900X is at $342, and the 3D variant at $327. The 7700X is at $245 on Amazon, and the 7600X is at $185 also on Amazon. As for the Intel 14900K, it's currently $548, and a 13900K is $417, both on Amazon. Considering what's going on with Intel chips, I would stay away from those for now, at least until Intel puts out a BIOS update or something to lock the boost frequencies on the preferred cores. I personally went back to the 12900K, which after you've disabled the E cores, works like a breeze, a warm, loud breeze, but a breeze nonetheless. And a 12900K is $261 right now, but you are buying into an older platform, of course. So the question is, should you buy a Zen 5 9000 series CPU at launch in a couple weeks? Or wait until October to see what Intel does with Arrow Lake S and the inevitable 9000X 3D follow up from AMD? I think the answer is obvious. With such a meager uplift compared to last gen, and knowing full well that AMD will be launching X3D chips to answer Arrow Lake S, buying a 9000 chip at launch is most likely going to be ill-advised. In fact, looking at the prices of the previous generation, Zen 5 9000 CPUs are simply unbuyable if the leaked prices are close to the final ones. I mean, AMD will be glad that people are buying the 7000 series and clearing stock of those, but it won't be at the margins that AMD has promised shareholders. Honestly, I think this is the wrong strategy from AMD. I think they should just come out strong with the X3D chips with a three-month lead on Intel in instead of waiting to react to Arrow Lake S and only then launched the non-X chips later as the cheaper alternatives to X3D that they effectively are. Why cling to this follower mentality when even time is on AMD's side is beyond me. If AMD are confident in their Zen 5 micro architecture, then just release the damn X3D chips first, or at least the 9800X3D for gamers and enthusiasts, trying to push the non-3D parts to early adopters while withholding some of the best performers just to react to Intel later in the year is not only disrespectful to their loyal enthusiast fans, but also an admission of being comfortable in being second place in the market, always looking to competitors as to how to position their own products, both in consumer CPUs and GPUs, versus Nvidia in that case. This is especially misguided in a time where Intel is at its most vulnerable. I did a video a couple of months ago about why I think Lisa Su should be replaced as CEO, and as time goes on and the status quo stays the same, I feel like that change needs to come sooner rather than later. If we look at AMD's revenues, after a meteoric rise from 2020 to 2022, the last couple of years have been of stagnation, and that's despite the AI hype, whereas Intel had the opposite trend with revenue falling from 2021 till 2023, this year they've been showing signs of recovery with around 8% growth. We'll see at the end of this month when earnings come out how things will look ahead for AMD, but I worry that the lack of innovation will get them in trouble, and especially the lack of aggressiveness. It's not that their products are necessarily bad, it's just that they are not improving at a fast enough rate, and they are not introducing anything that's particularly unique to entice consumers. AMD desperately needs some hot blood 
someone who can clean house of bureaucracy and build a more ambitious strategy and line of products. To put things in perspective, AMD currently has less than a quarter of the CPU market and less than a sixth of the GPU market. Recently, AMD's execs have been telegraphing that they will be pivoting into a software company first and a hardware company second. That's basically what Nvidia said five years ago. AMD's execs also claim they are working on unifying the CPU and RDNA microarchitectures in order to simplify the software stack. That's what Intel said four years ago when they announced One API. So again, AMD is a follower, not a leader, lagging a good half a decade behind their competitors. I think AMD should be looking ahead of the curve, and for that to happen, I think they need a new perspective. I mean, it's nice to see AMD finally investing in software, don't get me wrong, and they have tripled their software team's headcount, which is definitely positive, but it all feels late and way behind the innovation curve. Anyway, Zen 5 is, from the information available so far, a complete pass, in my opinion. The X3D variants might keep things interesting for gamers, though, so we'll see. As always, wait for full independent reviews to make a call on purchasing. If you enjoy my content, be sure to subscribe to the channel and consider supporting my work on Patreon and get exclusive access to the Cortex Discord server. A huge thanks to my awesome patrons for their continued support. Thanks for watching and until the next one.